structured dinner conversation, but we're running a few minutes late, and I'd like to try to get us a little bit back on track. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Jim Oliver, and I am the provost here at uh, the Seminole campus, and I want to thank you for coming to our Village Square uh, dinner this evening. Um, I want to start, if you would please, I hate to interrupt your dinner this way, but if you'd please stand and join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks very much. I thought it was a little joke. I might ask you to continue standing and eating down from there, but no. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Um, it, it's it's uh, great to see you. Great to have you here tonight. Um, our Village Square members and our guests. Um, and as usual, we're pleased to see so many students become part of our audience this evening. Uh, we do have uh, students representing three of our campuses, our downtown campus, our St. Pete Gibbs campus, and of course, right here in our Seminole campus. They're from American government classes, applied ethics classes, and our baccalaureate program, program in public policy and administration, as well as members of the Student Government Association. Uh, would all the students please stand and be recognized? Can we see our students, please? Yeah, we're going to make you stand several times. <laughs> One of the reasons that we founded, you can have a seat. One of the reasons we founded the, the Institute was to have an opportunity for our students to engage in, in uh, civic matters. And so this is, this is right in our wheelhouse, so to speak. We also want to acknowledge our media sponsors, the Tampa Bay Times and WEDU Television. Let's give them a round of applause. For We're excited about the program tonight. Uh, if you've been here for previous Village Square uh, programs uh, in the past year, uh, you're familiar with our instant polling that we've been doing uh, to create more engagement between the speakers and the audience. This is not just about presentation, this is about conversation and about dialogue. We want to talk about the issues that we're, faced, uh, we're facing in, in this country, um, and one of the ways we intend to do that is through our instant polling. Um, so that's why uh, David announced the survey uh, while we were having you food, so we could get some, some momentum going and, and get some votes going. Um, I, I hope you've had some interesting conversations over dinner, and that you'll have uh, some more as the evening uh, progresses. Uh, we want you to be able to exchange views and to, to learn from one another as part of this process. Uh, we've asked our students who stood, so you saw them, to be um, conversation facilitators uh, as part of this exercise of civic engagement. And so students, this is a chance uh, to hone your leadership skills as well. Uh, before we begin, uh, we're going to go back uh, to the question on the screen. If you came in late, um, here's one more chance uh, to vote on this question. Should the United States Supreme Court legalize same-sex marriage, make same-sex marriage, or legalize same-sex marriage in all 50 of the United States? Uh, if you've already voted, um, please disregard the instructions I'm about to give because you're only allowed to vote once. I, I laugh about that because before we perfected this technology, uh, we found that uh, uh, student, uh, individuals were able to vote more than once. Um, and so we had about three times the number of votes that we had the audience, uh, we fixed it. So you can only vote once. Uh, if you've not yet joined the poll, here's how you get in. Using the text function of your phone, everybody knows how to text. Text 22333, that's the party that you'd like to, to text. And after you receive a confirmation that you've joined the poll, respond by A, if you think the Supreme Court should legalize same-sex marriage, B, if you think the court should not legalize same-sex marriage, and C, if you're undecided, and maybe here to hear both sides of the debate. Um, while you're doing that, let me emphasize this is not a scientific poll. Um, since this is not a randomly selected audience. Um, think of this as more of a straw poll, an unofficial vote taken as an indication of the, of the uh, thinking in this particular audience. Okay, um, I hope everyone has had a chance to vote. We won't close the poll quite yet, but at the close of my remarks we will do so, uh, and we'll discuss the results of the poll and your thoughts on these questions later tonight. Now to introduce our moderator, let's bring to the podium uh, one more time David Clement, who is the Executive Director of our Institute. 
Ms. Cummings. Thank you, Dr. Oliver. It is a pleasure to introduce our moderator for this evening, Mr. Craig Cobb. He, he was previously here to moderate another uh, topic of great interest to Floridians, medical marijuana, just about a year ago. As you can see from his, bi <coughs> excuse me, his bio on the program, Craig is a veteran broadcast journalist who until this last month was the voice of uh, many of us carried with us in our car if we listen to NPR on the way to work or home. He left that post, he was the host of All Things Considered. He left that post last month to become station manager at WMNF Tampa. I, for one, miss him in my car, but I'm happy he could be here tonight to moderate this program. And without further uh, delay, I would like to call him to the stage. You can see his full bio in the program. Mr. Cobb. Good evening, everybody. Um, I uh, love this uh, format. I love this village square. Uh, this is where the rubber meets the road uh, when we talk about issues. Uh, I've been in the news business since 1974, uh, from the resignation of Richard Nixon on up through all sorts of turmoil and wonderful things and horrible things. Uh, the media has, over time, changed a great deal. Um, at one point, it was where everybody got together and talked about what was going on in a certain way. Um, these Village Square uh, meetings uh, have replicated that in a way that I find it incredibly stimulating, and I hope you do too, because it is just a, a wonderful way to break down an issue and understand it in a different way and hear all the different opinions and thoughts, some of which you will hear tonight that you hadn't heard before. Uh, you actually learn things here. I learn things here, and uh, it's a wonderful thing to do. Um, thank you to David for asking me to be a part of this program. He knows how much I like it, and uh, I originally told him I couldn't do it because I was at another radio station, and it's their fun drive and you don't skip fun drives. Um, and then I sent him a message when I took my new job and said, I'm on, you still need me, and he did, and here I am. Tonight we're gonna to be talking about same-sex marriage. Um, you may have noticed it in the news here or there. Um, it's been in the news a lot in recent months as federal district courts in a lot of states overturned state bans on same-sex uh, same marriage. Um, it's going to be back on the front burner here soon, as the United States Supreme Court argues from four states appealing the district court denials of their bans. Uh, so tonight we're going to hear some arguments for and against same-sex marriage. We're also going to review uh, the legal aspects of the issue. There are those aplenty. And uh, also the sociological implications. So we're going to cover it all. This issue has been moving very fast. The conversation we're going to have, have tonight is fundamentally different than the conversation we would have had about this topic 18 months ago. It's moving that fast. I hope tonight we're going to be all be able to catch up on everything that's going on with this. So let's get started by meeting our panelists. First up, uh, speaking for the legalization of same-sex marriage, Hannah Willard. Ms. Willard is Central Florida Field Organizer for Equality in Florida and statewide coordinator of its marriage equality campaign in that role. She managed the logistics surrounding the fight for marriage equality in Florida. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Hannah Willard. And as Hannah walks up and takes her seat, I'd like to introduce to you, speaking against legalizing same-sex marriage, will be John Stenberger. Mr. Stenberger is an Orlando attorney and president of the Florida Family Policy Council. 
where he chaired the successful campaign to amend the Florida's Constitution to define marriage as the union of one man and one woman in 2008. Ladies and gentlemen, please warm welcome for John Stemberg. Next, we'll be reviewing some of the legal aspects of this issue. As I said, providing that review, Ben Diamond. Ben Diamond is an attorney in St. Petersburg who is admitted to practice before the U.S. Supreme Court. His recent article, Same Sex Marriage and Retroactive Rights, was published by the St. Petersburg Bar Association. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Ben Diamond. And last but not least, I don't want to say the college is their own, uh, <laughs> providing some insights into the sociological aspects of what really is a significant and rapid, as I said before, cultural change is Dr. David Liebert. He's a professor and academic department chair for social and behavioral sciences at St. Petersburg College. Dr. Liebert teaches psychology at SPC and is a licensed mental health counselor, Dr. Liebert. We have all the expertise you need tonight to learn something. So let's get at it. Each panelist is going to open with a brief presentation. And we're all going to have a chance to uh, speak. We'll have a discussion of some of the issues raised. And some talk among ourselves at your tables. And we'll see what is on your mind. But we're going to start with Ms. Willard. You can speak from where you're sitting. You don't have to stand. I'll do all the standing tonight. Thank you, Craig, and thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to begin the conversation because I think it's a unique opportunity to frame the conversation where I believe it should be framed, which is um, centered around the couples for whom marriage means the world. And those are the same-sex couples who have been able to finally marry each other over the last few months since January 6th when the shameful and discriminatory ban on same-sex marriage fell here in Florida, as well as the thousands more who married in other states, live in Florida, and are now receiving the legal rights and protections that only marriage provides. And so I think that sometimes the conversation is skewed away from the couples for whom this um, means the most, and so I'm excited to, to kick off with it centered around that. I couldn't agree more, Craig. The past 18 months, really the past seven years, has been just a seismic shift in cultural opinion, in society. Um, generally, I, I've been really privileged to be at the center of this movement here in Florida, but also being in a state like Florida is a really uh, unique opportunity, given that we're a state in the South, we have such a diverse population, population, so many different communities within our large state, and we brought the tipping point um, when marriage equality arrived here in Florida, where officially two-thirds of Americans lived in states that had marriage equality. That number is now at 72%, which is just incredible, given that a year ago, we, you know, we could never have imagined the world in which we now live. Um, it's been a privilege to, to really be at the center of all of that here in Florida. And just today, actually, we uh, got word of a poll that was released by the public policy polling firm in Raleigh, North Carolina, that shows that 81% of Floridians now say that the legalization of same-sex marriage has either a positive impact on their daily life or no impact whatsoever. That is a, I mean, that's, absolute 180 from just seven years ago when the majority passed the ban on same-sex marriage to our Florida Constitution. So what happened? How, how did we do that? How did we win marriage here in a state like Florida? And as the statewide LGBT civil rights organization, we felt obligated to pursue the most expeditious route to marriage equality for our members and for the countless same-sex couples here in Florida. So we were proud last January to file a lawsuit with six plaintiff couples on behalf of the Freedom to Marry, um, which we won this past June. And on January 6th, 3,000 and more couples were able to finally marry the person that they love. What we found was we needed to pursue the most expeditious route to marriage equality because we couldn't wait a single day longer. For so many couples, they 
They couldn't wait. There were couples for whom the arrival of January 6th meant that they could be walked down the aisle by their ailing father, um, who could sign their marriage license while lying in a hospital bed. I think of Liz and Joan in uh, Orlando. And Liz lost her hard-fought battle to cancer in December, just days before her son was born. So not only did she not have access to potentially life-saving treatment by being listed on her partner's health insurance plan, um, the way a married couple has access to that option, she also passed away being denied the right to be recognized as part of her son's life. And so those stories I, I bring up just because um, January 6th could not come soon enough, and we wait um, in hopeful anticipation for national resolution for the freedom to marry because there are couples just like Liz and Joan all across the nation who need this and for whom marriage matters um, the most. I think that it's also um, important to recognize that we had so much support from unlikely messengers. We had so many file amicus briefs in support of the freedom to marry um, in both the lawsuit with which um, Equality Florida was a plaintiff of, but also this recent Supreme Court um, filing. And there were 379 businesses that were in support of the freedom to marry, nearly 2,000 clergy from 50 different denominations, over 200 first responders, including the chief of police here in Tampa and the sheriff of Broward County. And I think what has been most significant is that we've seen this seismic shift because we started to have conversations with those who weren't sure how they felt about same-sex marriage. Hardly a week goes by in the work that I do where we don't hear from someone who voted in favor of that ban in 2008 and now tells us that they regret that decision, that through conversations with coworkers, nieces, nephews, friends, family members, they see that same-sex couples want to get married for the same reasons that any couple wants to get married. They're in love. They want to build a life together. Perhaps they've already built a life together. They want to start a family. And really, they want to take care of the people that they love the most. And that's what marriage means. That's what marriage is. And there's really nothing more American than wanting to build a life with the person that you love and be able to take care of them in really concrete and tangible ways. And so I would argue that um, one of the most meaningful reasons why this shift has happened is because of those conversations, because of those stories that we were able to share as the LGBT community and as couples who had spent um, two or three times you know, the years is, you know, twice or three times as much as I've been alive, I guess, uh, these couples who, you know, now been able to marry. And on January 5th, um, I went to a wedding at midnight in Osceola County, and I watched a couple who had just spent 20 years together, pledged to spend the rest of their lives together. And that day was incredibly emotional for um, a lot of us, perhaps some people in this room, and, um, and for a lot of our staff at Poly Florida who've been working towards this for you know, years, decades. For me, it meant something very specific. Um, my partner and I are not yet ready to get married. And we have a life together, we are in love. Um, but on January 6th, we became just like every other young couple who is not yet ready to get married and yet looks forward to the day when we get to proclaim our commitment to each other in front of our friends and family. And when we make that decision, it will be a decision that we get to make without offering excuses, apologies, or explanations. It will simply be about the freedom to marry. Thank you. Now there are always two sides to uh, every story, and we get the other side now from John Stenberger. John, um, if you'd like to uh, talk. Sure, thank you, uh, David, for organizing this event in uh, Belk Square. This is, this is really a remarkable form. I wish there was one of these in every city in Florida, if not America. Um, I want to laser focus on the specific question that's on the screen. Uh, there's a statistic quoted to you about 81%. Uh, Floridians couldn't see the negative impact of same-sex marriage, and that's exactly what I want to talk to you about. What are the implications of the society and culture 
as a result of redefining marriage in society. And I want to submit to you, there's really three points I'd like to make. And it really does affect a lot of things. You would think it only affects the two people uh, living together and joining themselves together. But it really does. It has a profound effect upon many areas of life. But I want to focus on three of those. First of all, I want to submit to you that same-sex marriage really leads to the end of gender in society. And what I mean by that is that the beauty and the importance of the differences between men and women becomes devalued. It becomes diminished confused, and eventually just lost. And I would say exhibit A for this is Massachusetts, um, where this is played out considerably. Uh, in Massachusetts, uh, the marriage licenses no longer read husband and wife, they now read party A and party B. And this is not just in this form, but in every form in Massachusetts. And in fact, in the entire Massachusetts code, all references to gender have been struck, and only gender neutral terms are used. Um, this also affects a public education, Am I working here, or am I just having to? Uh, children, uh, first and second graders are, are learning how to read from Heather has two mommies and the king and the king. Now, you can be a very strong supporter of gay rights and gay marriage and, and realize that this is just entirely inappropriate to be introducing uh, sensitive topics on human sexuality, let alone homosexuality, to children at that young of age. That's a parent's decision to make with each child to know when they're mature enough to be able to uh, comprehend these topics. And parents have sued. They've tried to say, can we opt out? And the government said, no. The courts have basically said, look, if you're in the public school, you take it hook, line, and sinker. There's no options. There's no way for you to be, uh, do anything other than what the school is teaching. And then finally, we see in many other schools, school boards are actually telling teachers, you cannot refer to students as boys and girls. You have to refer to them in gender neutral terms like friends, or in this case, purple penguins. Now, I'm not making this up. I'm just reporting it. So you can see there's a devaluing of the beauty of gender, the differences between men and women, is it becomes lost in this society. Secondly, the essence, the meaning, I would submit the very social purpose of marriage to join children to their natural parents is devalued, is confused, and is also eventually lost. Now, there are many enemies to marriage today. Marriage is on the rocks, it is an institution that's not doing well. Divorce. Infidelity, cohabitation, and pornography all help to both prevent marriage and family formation, and then they also uh, encourage the dissolution or the destruction of marriages once they are formed. And so these are, are problems, but I would submit to you that same sex marriage really doesn't do anything to help strengthen marriage. It actually further weakens the institution. Because once you move, this is very important, once you remove the gender requirement, there's really no end to the buffet choices that marriage becomes. And so we see modern culture and in real life, uh, polygamy becomes an open question, not just in the kind of in the extremes of culture, but by literal academics who are arguing for this. We see the practice of uh, polymory, or, uh, which is multiple, uh, basically group marriage, uh, where folks are saying, look, and, and the problem with this is that if marriage can mean anything, then marriage means nothing. That's the problem. And so instead of having an idea that we're holding up, and we're saying this is special, let's treat it special, let's make it an idea, it then becomes devalued. I guess I'm not really in control here. So here's a woman that says she wanted to marry herself. Um, again, there's just no end to this. You can switch to the next one. Uh, Jonathan Turley, a pro, you know, constitutional law professor at George Washington University, uh, arguing for polygamy and group marriage. These are not just people in the extreme of society. Elizabeth Emmons, University of Chicago Law School, written an extensive law review on why now that we have gay marriage, we should also allow polygamy and group marriage structures. And as you can see, the, the rate of marriage is declining every year. Marriage is in decline. Uh, and the rate of cohabitation every year is increasing. And so what this is going to do, I would submit, is that eventually we will see a collapse in the social order. Uh, we've, we're already seeing this in the inner cities, but now into the suburbs where marriage and family structures are breaking down, causing the government to step in, more programs, more big brother in our lives, more trying to take care of marriage and family structures that ought to be taken care of by mothers and fathers. My final point, and this is the most important one, is that everywhere we've seen sex marriage legalized, we also see uh, non-discrimination ordinances where they're adding uh, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. And these are being used as weapons to punish primarily people of faith, to force them to engage and to participate in same-sex ceremonies. Not just, we're not talking about denying uh, homosexual persons of services or benefits, we're talking about forcing them to participate in a ceremony. 
And so as a result, um, we see um, uh, Mrs. Stutzman out of the state of Washington as a, a florist. She regularly has a friend of hers who, who's, who's a gay person. Uh, she's been providing flowers for him for many years. He comes in and says, hey, I'm going to get married. He's all excited. And she just gently says, you know what? I can't, I can't do that. I can't provide flowers for you. And so he goes back and tells his partner. They file a, a lawsuit based upon these non-discrimination ordinances. She's looking at upwards of $150,000 in fines for refusing not to provide flowers to gay people, but refusing to participate in what she believes is a form of art uh, in a, a, a same-sex wedding ceremony. Again, I could go on and on. A baker out of the, out of the state of Colorado, again, being sued through the Civil Rights Commissioner, called a Nazi for just saying, look, I can't, I'll do a cake for your, uh, you know, your, your birthday or your celebration. I just can't do one for your same-sex wedding ceremony. Uh, Blaine Adamson's a printer. Um, he has hands-on original. He, his t-shirts are originally designed and a gay pride parade said, would you print our t-shirts? He said, I can't do that. I'm sorry. He gave him three other options of, of t-shirt companies that could do it. Again, sued under the non-discrimination ordinances. Again, these two folks are ministers. This is part of their ministry. They actually marry people uh, and they said, you know what? We can't do this. These folks are looking at thousand dollars in fines and 180 days in jail for every day that they continue in violation of just saying, you know what, we can't use this. This is like our church. This is the chapel we use as a ministry, and we can't perform the ceremonies. Uh, the fire chief of Atlanta just fired because he wrote a book, a ministry book, which basically talked about homosexuality using the biblical terms, and, and, and the mayor said, we can't have this. The book was published over a year ago. I'm closing. Uh, and they fired him because of that. Again, he worked for the... Uh, Obama administration was the top fire chief in the nation, uh, and now he's disqualified from serving just because he expressed his beliefs in a ministry book that had nothing to do with his job. So, uh, you know, my, I would submit to you that there's wide-ranging consequences that are negative as a result of same-sex marriage in this or something. Thank you, John. Um, and the details wrapped up in this issue um, don't stop there. Uh, there are a lot of legal issues. The first question we had tonight was about the Supreme Court. Now let's hear from Ben Diamond about the, the legal aspects um, still in process on the, the concept of same-sex marriage. Ben. Well, thanks very much. And, and first I want to say how privileged I am to be here at St. Petersburg College. Being a native of Pinellas County, I have a, a long uh, uh, appreciation for this institution and several members of my family have graduated from here and I want to thank um, thank you for hosting this forum I think it's a really wonderful uh, concept and I particularly want to thank my friend David Clement for inviting me um, I, I got interested in this issue um, as a lawyer because my law practice primarily focuses on helping families with their estate planning and probate administration after somebody in their family dies. And, um, and in that practice, I've learned that there's all sorts of benefits that married couples enjoy under the law that uh, non-married couples do not. And um, so I've started sort of working on this issue from a legal perspective because that I see it a lot in my law practice. Um, the, the one thing I think everybody on this panel will agree with, and maybe the only thing, and again, my role here is not to advocate for a position. I think Hannah and John will do a great job articulating the different positions. Um, but the one thing there is agreement on is just how quickly change has come on this issue. Um, the first state, and we saw it in John's slide there with the Massachusetts uh, marriage certificate, the Massachusetts was the first state in which the courts recognized that, that uh, same-sex marriage um, is legal, that was only 11 years ago. And now couples can marry in 36 states, including the District of Columbia. And there has been this remarkable sea change in public opinion about this issue. Um, so, so now the, case that is, the cases that are headed to the United States Supreme Court will ultimately decide the question. And I want to take my time and just give a little overview as to what the background is on those cases and what I think may happen, what some of the arguments we will hear 
The oral argument is scheduled in April. There'll be two and a half hours of argument, and then the court will issue its opinions um, at the end of its term this summer in June. The cases are appeals from four states, Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee. And the questions are, there are two questions in the cases. First is whether the Constitution requires states to issue marriage license to same-sex couples. And the second question is whether the states must recognize same-sex marriages performed in other states where they're legal. So um, the, the key decision that's in the background in this litigation is a decision that was rendered by the United States Supreme Court um, two years ago in a case called United States versus Windsor. And I just want to spend a little bit of time sharing with you some of the story and, and arguments from that case because it really will inform, I think, what the Supreme Court ultimately decides this summer. It was another probate case, sort of my area of practice. Um, you had two women who lived in New York, um, Edie Windsor and her partner, Thea Spire. They had a 40-year um, relationship. And uh, in 2007, they went to Canada where it was legal for same-sex couples to get married, and they got married. Well, they came back to New York, and unfortunately, two years later, in 2009, Thea died. Well, Edie and Thea were pretty wealthy people, and um, Thea had left her entire estate to her partner, Edie. Edie wanted to claim the federal estate tax exemption that is available for surviving spouses because she and Thea had been married in Canada. The Internal Revenue Service took the position that Edie was not entitled to that exemption. And they based that on a federal law called the Defense of Marriage Act. And that law basically said that marriage under federal law is defined as a union between one man and one woman. And so the IRS said the estate tax exemption, sorry Edie, you don't get it. You have to pay us, Uncle Sam, close to $400,000 in estate tax. So Edie did that very reluctantly, and then she sued the federal government. And her argument was that the law unconstitutionally singled out same-sex couples for different treatment than married couples. Um, the court issued an opinion in the case, and it was a 5-4 opinion by Justice Kennedy, and I think the opinion by Justice Kennedy and the dissent from Justice Scalia really sort of foreshadow some of the arguments that we're going to hear this April when this, these questions come back before the court. Justice Kennedy gave a very passionate opinion for the majority in which he said, the Defense of Marriage Act in this federal law, the whole purpose of it is to impose inequality. And it tells all of these couples that their otherwise valid marriage is unworthy of recognition, it's second tier. And he brought up the children being raised by gay couples and he said, it humiliates tens of thousands of children now being raised by these couples and it makes it difficult for these children to understand the integrity and closeness of their own families. Justice Scalia wrote the dissenting opinion and he was joined in that opinion by the three conservative, three other conservative justices on the court. And what Justice Scalia saw the case as being about was about our ability to, as, as people in a democracy, to govern ourselves. And he said, we as a court really have no power to invalidate these laws that state legislators have validly elected state legislators have enacted. Um, Justice Scalia sort of saw, though, that that opinion that struck down the federal law would provide a legal rationale for challenges to all of the different states that had adopted bans of same-sex marriages. So, and that is exactly what happened. Justice Scalia was exactly right. 
Um, there has been sweeping litigation across the country over this issue, and I see my time is running out, but when, hopefully when we talk more, I can talk a little bit more about some of the arguments that the states are making and that the plaintiffs are making in the case that's coming up before the Supreme Court. But that's just by way of background. Thanks. So now you know why things move so quickly. Um, one decision led to a whole bunch of decisions. That's why I love these things. Listening. Um, there are other aspects. Some of them have already been raised this evening in terms of um, sociological effects of, of same-sex marriage. And um, here to just uh, talk a little bit about um, how these are being handled, you know, the sociological aspects. It's a significant and rapid cultural change. We're all absorbing it. Um, and here to talk a little bit about how we're doing with that and what we can do um, is Dr. David Lieber. David. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, just take a quick opportunity to thank David for uh, inviting me here tonight. Um, yes, I am uh, a professor here at the college. But uh, I'd like to start by making one point extremely clear. Uh, it was an invitation for me to be here. Uh, there was no pressure. It wasn't as though my dean said, you need to go there and present. I had an interest in accepting the invitation. Uh, we've heard positions in favor of, in opposition, against. My position is actually very, very different. Uh, my position is as a social scientist. Uh, one concern I have you know, as a social scientist where I spend the majority of my time in a classroom, I'm a classroom teacher, I'm very concerned when controversial topics such as the one that we are looking at and discussing here tonight polarize our students, polarize our community. We need to be able to, in forms just like this, to be able to meet together, we need to be able to talk about opposing ideas, and we need to be able to respectfully listen to each other and not become encamped in our position. And I strive in my classroom to ensure that position, that um, uh, issues such as this, students who don't know where I stand, I believe I overstep my authority as a professor when I let students know where, what position I personally take when I go into a voting booth and vote for those who will represent me in such issues. So I hope when I talk about data, and I'm not going to talk about data in the sense of numbers, but when I talk about social science, that you respect that these ideas, the, these, again, not number statistics, but the sociological data is really unbiased. Um, as particularly listening to ideas being discussed here this evening that favor uh, same-sex marriage versus ideas opposed to same-sex marriage, we actually begin to define a sociological definition of marriage. You know we have an attorney as well who would uh, define marriage most likely in a legal contractual sense, that's what attorneys do. Sociologists will tend to take a different perspective on the question. We'll refer to marriage as a social institution. I realize and respect others and they use terms like it's a sacrament, but in a sociology class, we're going to refer to it as a social institution. And by a social institution, what we mean is a dynamic institution. This institution, which has survived centuries, and because it survived centuries, it meets very basic fundamental needs that we have in a society. At the same time, it also meets extremely important needs that we have as individuals heard that reflected in uh, two of our presenters here this evening. So I am respectful when I hear discussion. I want to hear the discussion. I want, to, I want in my classrooms, my students, in forums such as this, you all, I want us to ask the tough questions concerning the societal impact regarding marriage. We do have a vested interest as a community, as a society, in this institution called marriage. We look to this institution to meet basic staple needs in our society. Um, this is an institution, for instance, that we primarily look at as a way of replenishing our population. Questions concerning same-sex marriage and reproduction and replenishing our population. It's a conversation we need to talk about. 
for those in same-sex relationships who bring children into the relationship? It's a difficult question, but there is a viable question to be explored and debated concerning the psychological well-being. Do we have reason for concern, or is there no reason for concern? These are conversations that we have to have. I hope these are questions that you all uh, wish to engage in. On the other side of the continuum, when we talk about the, uh, the institution of marriage as meeting our own social needs, our very personal needs, in other words, this institution has value. Uh, and I can direct you to very good data that shows marriage has value. Research will show married people are statistically happier than those in cohabitating relationships, those in dating relationships. Married people do report lower incident rates of mental illness than what we see in cohabitating couples, single couples. Married folks who are raising children are more likely to have children who graduate from high school. They are less likely to have children who experience juvenile conviction. Um, despite the old uh, myth uh, what is the uh, opposite of a aphrodisiac wedding cake? Uh, <laughs> statistics would actually show married couples are profoundly more, I mean substantially more, more. You look at the data, you look at the graphs, they're more happy with their sex life and satisfied than what we see with cohabitating couples uh, or dating couples. There is value in this relationship. So I do want us to be able to engage the conversation, that by denying access to certain parties in our, in our country, uh, our states, saying you don't have access to a, a means, a mechanism that actually produces value and benefit, uh, are we actually intruding upon one's right to pursue happiness? And in my final comment, from a sociological perspective, because this institution meets so many of our societal needs, it is a flexible institution. This is not the first time the institution of marriage has had questions posed concerning what it can and cannot tolerate. We've had questions regarding the legality of interracial relationships, marriages. We've questioned interfaith relationships. We have changed ages of marriage. We've even changed our understanding as to what marriage actually represents. Um, I mean, do we still today believe that marriage is defined in such a way that a woman is under the authority of her husband, that he is in absolute control, or do we look at it more as an, uh, a partnership? So even our meaning of it has been flexible. So in, in, in spite of the concerns, I will take the position that this is a flexible, dynamic institution that can tolerate change. Thank you so much. Thanks, David. Um, plenty of food for thought. Plenty of food for thought. And of course, um, I'll give you a little more because we have another survey question. Um, you should still be logged on if you voted on the, the last one. Uh, but we do have another survey question to lay on you, and this one is, should Florida pass legislation that ends discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity in housing, employment, or public accommodations? As you can see, A is what you text if you want to say you support that, B is what you want to text if you uh, oppose that, or C if you are undecided. If you're not logged into the poll, we would like to just ask the student at your table if they're there to help. And lead and practice your telephone skills and then help you with that. So um, while you're voting, um, let's take a few minutes to talk about this. Why don't you take a couple of minutes to talk about these survey questions at your table? Just a couple, because we are running just a tad behind here. And uh, then we'll uh, see if you want to share some of your views with the students at your table and talk about it. So just a couple of minutes here, uh, walk amongst yourselves, as they say, and uh, we'll be back with you after we get the results of these polls.
And therefore, you, state, or lawyer for the state, need to come forward and present a rational basis or a reason why that ban should continue, because it is discriminatory. And the question at the heart in all of these cases has been whether the lawyers for the state have been able to articulate a valid enough response to that question. The yeah, Constitution, any, any topic that is not expressly in the Constitution is, is for the state. So all of the domestic relations policy, divorce, custody, this was always been state law. And what's happening here is that they're arguing that under the federal Constitution with the Equal Protection Clause, a newfound right that just popped into existence somehow now invalidates those laws, a right that didn't exist before. And so that's the argument as to why as the federal. Uh, but really, it, it's completely, it's just as Scalia said, it's completely outside the scope. They have no power. And, and do you agree that this is a newfound right that is being recognized? I don't. I think that the U.S. Constitution and the United States Supreme Court do um, interject in issues of equal rights and civil rights. And I think that, um, you know, my tendency is to defer to lawyers. I'm not a lawyer myself. Um, when it comes to constitutional issues, but what we have found is that court after court after court after court has debunked those arguments in favor of same-sex marriage bans, and so we see that as being fairly universal across the country, and, and we see that continuing, um, hopefully, into the Supreme Court decision. We have a question over here. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I think that um, the reason that the Constitution did not specifically define marriage as a man and a woman because it was assumed that it always meant to be a man and a woman. So that definition is not uh, discarded as them not knowing or leaving it up to the states. It was. It was discarded and it was set aside knowing, under the common assumption that it was always meant to be a man and a woman. And the question that we should define it now based on discriminatory allegations is, to me, is really unfounded because it's a moral issue. It's not a constitutional issue. It's a moral choice and it's not a, 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 a civil uh, choice of actions that we should be discussing right now. I, I think this is interesting because I had a discussion with the, the panel beforehand and I'm going to be slightly revelatory here. I am a married man, a happily married man, but it's not my first marriage. My first marriage was uh, my first marriage was done by a minister and my second one was not. Um, well, one had a religious component in it and the second one did not. And I, I don't know if the question is for you or, or, or who might, I mean, how do you respond when someone says it's a moral issue and there was really no morality in play in my second uh, marriage? I was actually officiated by a federal judge and a county judge was there to sign the papers. Um, it was a contract. How do we handle that? Is it a contract? Under the law, if I was in a church, I understand that. But if I'm in just getting married, it, it, it seems like it's a, a contract. What's the moral component? I think it's it's many things. It's, it has a sociological component, it's a theological component, it's a legal component. Um, it is an institution which is multifaceted, um, and so it has has many uh, you know aspects to it. I think it's both moral and constitutional uh, in terms of. This, this conversation is not either or. Uh, so, you know. And another question, and this would be for you, I think this, this comes under your purview. Um, the, the Constitution was written at a time when it was, just, it was, I would wholly agree, assumed, that it was a man and a woman. Um, but you mentioned something there that I hadn't really thought about. Um, we've seen plenty of statistics about the decline of marriage, the high divorce rate, the 50% divorce rate, and that sort of thing. Um, talk a little more, I think, about the evolution of marriage. I had not 
come at it from that angle before. Well, if marriage is an institution that meets societal needs, as society changes, the dynamic of marriage also changes. Um, traditional roles, what we used to refer to as the traditional role, he's going to go out and, you know, kill the deer and she's going to cook it up and take care of the children. Traditional roles, roles that um, she's under the authority of her husband. I mean, those traditional roles have evolved over time because the needs that society has with this institution has also changed over time. I mean, it is somewhat amazing the extent to which this institution of marriage does meet social needs. I mean, you survey folks. What's the best number of children to have in your family? Two is usually the answer that comes up. I mean, we are just marginally over a zero population growth rate. Now, we're not China where we are dictated by law how many children we may not have. I mean, we are free to have as many children as we want. Uh, uh, yet, we seem to make extremely personal choices that is actually highly functional for our society. I mean, if we experience the type of baby boom that occurred starting in 1940, uh, 1945, we economically couldn't handle that. That would be an economic devastation to experience that type of population <coughs> growth. Yet our population normally ebbs and flows based on economic need, and this institution responds to it. So it's, a, it's amazingly adapting sociological institution. Um, John, do you think marriage can evolve the, the way we're talking about here, or is it a static institution? Yeah, I think that if you, if you, if you have a globe and you spin the globe and stab your finger on any, any landmass of any time in all human civilization, you will always find one sociological constant. <coughs> Marriage is always done between men and women. Now, sometimes between multiple spouses in less civilized societies, but always between men and women. And the reason for that is that logic, biology, history, tradition, the collective wisdom of humankind tells us that marriage, the essence of marriage, is between a man and a woman. If you look at a case like Loving versus Virginia, the court there didn't say, the court here didn't strike to the essence of marriage. They said that any man can marry any woman irrespective of race and ethnicity. See, because gender is an essential component to marriage. Race and, race and ethnicity is not an essential component to marriage. It is not a requirement for marriage. And so by, uh, by, by saying that uh, any uh, race or ethnicity can marry each other, they were actually reinforcing the essence of marriage. They weren't redefining it. And now we're redefining marriage by, by, by taking the very required component of gender and saying that's a free question. And you see the result of that when I show this in the slides. Um, we also had, oh, we do have a question over, over here, I think. It's a question, they're always on the other side of the room, you know that. So we wanted to get your exercise for the evening, and you got it. Okay. Yes, I have a question about, if, they were, if the Supreme Court were to, we, there were actually two questions. If the Supreme Court was to, let's say, legalize the language, would that apply to the U.S. territories as well as the states? Because I don't hear a lot about <coughs> territories. It's like, I heard something about like Puerto Rico or something. Would it? Well, I, I mean, I think I'll give you a lawyer answer, which is it depends <laughs> on how they, how they roll. I, I don't really know the answer to that question. It's a great question. Um, but I, I, I do want to respond to a couple uh, couple comments on I think that was a really interesting little discussion we just had. I mean. The, the federal judge in Florida, let me just talk for a minute about Florida, if I could, since we're all Floridians. Um, you know, we have two bans on same-sex marriage under Florida law, I guess we should say. We had two bans. Um, one was a, a law passed in 1997 that defined marriage as between a man and a woman. And then in 2008, we put in our state constitution that marriage is defined as, as, um, as, um, the legal union of only a man and a woman. And um, those laws were challenged and in a case in the Northern District of Florida that was decided by a federal judge, Judge Hinkle, and he referred back to the Loving versus Virginia case, but he had a, a, a different take on it than John. I mean, I think those arguments were presented. I, judge Hinkle looked at the Loving case and said, you know, that, that if you look back at the purpose of the Constitution, it's the goal is to secure liberty. And um, 
when we look back at the decision and the state laws prohibiting interracial marriage, the, um, the arguments in support of the ban on interracial marriage, however sincerely held at the time, now seem to us to be an obvious pretext for racism. And Judge Hinkle said in the, this opinion that the laws that we have that define marriage as between only a man and a woman and exclude these same-sex couples from the legal benefits of marriage will be seen as an obvious pretext for discrimination, even though those arguments and those positions are very sincerely held today. Um, one of the arguments that the states are making as to the benefits of traditional marriage in defense of these laws is that it's critical that marriage be defined as between a man and a woman because the purpose of marriage, I mean we're getting into some real fundamental issues here, is to procreate, is to have kids. And same-sex couples cannot procreate. This is, this is one of the major arguments. The response to that has been, but neither can many opposite-sex couples, right? And many opposite-sex couples do not want to have kids, but they can still get married. Um, Florida has never conditioned marriage on our desire to have children. That's the response to that argument. Um, so what you're left with is this, this sort of uh, core idea that the bans come from moral disapproval yeah. of same-sex marriage. And then the legal question is, is that enough? Is moral disapproval of those bans enough? And that's a very interesting question because there are cases, like one decided by the Supreme Court, called Lawrence versus Texas, that basically said moral bans that prohibit sodomy, that prohibit gay sex, are, that those bans are unconstitutional because there's no rational basis for it. So there's, there's arguments out there. I mean, that's just trying to give you a flavor of some of the issues um, that, that are being raised both in defense of the laws and, and trying to attack the laws. Hannah, um, how does your group um, respond to some of these um, consequences that are, that are laid out here um, when you uh, legalize same-sex marriage? Um, uh, we've talked about any number of things, uh, but uh, the, the disappearance of gender, the uh, lack of procreation. How, how do you respond? Some people take that seriously. I would respond just by saying that um, January 6th came and went and the sky has not fallen. Um, Same-sex couples are marrying here in Florida in 36 states um, across the country in countless countries across the world and the world is turning and and I what we would respond is that these arguments have been presented very thoughtfully, very carefully, very cleverly, very sincerely held beliefs and sound legal arguments presented, and they've just been debunked by court after court after court. All of these judges have ruled in support of same-sex couples' fundamental right to marry, and I was in the courtroom and during the oral arguments of the um, case in Miami-Dade, in which Equality Florida was a plaintiff, and the argument um, of the welfare of children was introduced in sort of this idea that uh, children fare best in households with one mother and one father. And findings from the American Psychological Association, I'd be interested to hear what you, know, what you see on that. That's, that's just not true. That's, that's been debunked over and over by science and now by courts. Um, and also, I think that what we have seen is that there are so few people now in Florida and in the country who can't name coworkers, nieces, nephews, and friends who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender in same-sex partnerships or single. And 
And the very human desire to want to build a family, build a life, and have a partnership is something that all of us can relate to. And so I, I was also really fascinated by your perspective on how marriage has changed and evolved and how it is a dynamic institution. And I think um, those very real personal and social needs that marriage meets um, are really at the crux of this question for us. John, I know you wanted to respond, and I want to get over here and then talk to uh, David a minute before. Yeah, um, what is clear in social science, there's many propositions that are all over the board, but there's one proposition that's crystal clear, and that is that uh, whenever kids are raised in the context of a mother and father, uh, uh, all the factors for human flourishing are higher. And this is systematic, and this is not just one or two, this is thousands of peer reviewed studies that appear in referee journals. The inverse is true, it is. Uh, when, when you remove a mother or father, uh, the social maladies are higher systematically from depression, no abortion, high school dropouts, etc. We have no peer-reviewed uh, long-term study on same-sex parenting, but we do know that kids, right now, the data says kids flourish better with a mom and a dad. I mean, when, when the two parts of humanity come together and they can have both input, that's the optimal situation. So I, I would even disagree. I, I, I've been arguing this for 25 years, and that would not be my primary argument. Uh, about, uh, it's one of the arguments, but certainly the primary argument. I think the fact that the impact on children is a more significant argument. And, um, uh, you know, so, so I think that that's, I mean, that's, that's clear in the literature, uh, and that's kind of beyond dispute. Now, we'll wait to see what happens when same-sex marriage comes, and there's widespread studies that can be done. It's an open question. I just say we shouldn't subject kids to a vast contested social experiment. David, I can't let that go by without you coming. <laughs> Absolutely happy to do so. Um, listen, a couple comments that have been made here tonight is that this issue has moved fast. It has moved faster than data. Um, but we are also hearing folks make reference to well, this study or that study. Um, I'll quote my, my, my late doctoral advisor who said, David, what we do with our data, we choke it until it confesses. <laughs> That's the nice thing about statistics. Um, we can. T I mean, I would not begin to look at you all and argue that children are harmed by being raised in a heterosexual marriage with a mother and father. I'm not about to say that they are going to be harmed. Um, I don't want to talk about outcomes without robust data to do so. Um, some of the concerns, for instance that you know, children seem to uh, kind of die down in outcomes uh, when raised by a single parent. We are also dealing with the question of a broken home. Divorces uh, create harm for children. Children don't benefit from a divorce. They have to overcome that at sociological and psychological levels. Um, so I, I have some trouble taking those par uh, comments and parlaying it into same-sex relationships. But in answer to the question, I would be a little bit more anecdotal about it. Um, I would probably give the same advice. You've got to know when a psychologist is saying, let me give you some advice, close your ears. Um, oftentimes, harm is about to follow. But I would probably give very similar advice if I were speaking to a single parent following a death or divorce, as I would with a same-sex couple, um, I would probably suggest that there is importance in uh, trying to foster relationships with that child with the other sex. Develop and cultivate a close relationship with a grandmother, a close relationship with an uncle. That's not gonna bring harm. The closer the relationships that a child has within a close-knit family, the healthier that the child will be. Uh, so that, that would be my general anecdotal uh, advice in that regard. I guess follow up. Sure. Um, I, I agree with you, um, both from the data standpoint and anecdotally. So I, I think, and, and this may sound amazing to some of you, but I think that two uh, moms uh, actually capable of loving and caring for a child. That's not the question. The question, the entire law, and counsel here will tell you this, the law always wants to know, and I served for 13 years with Garden Ad Litem, uh, whether it's divorce, or custody disputes, or adoption, the court wants to know one thing for me as a Garden Ad Litem. What is in the best interest of that child? What is stunning is that whenever gay rights are involved, that standard is immediately dropped and all the data goes out the door. 
So we're asking what's best for the child. What's best for the child is clear in the data, and that's the mom and dad. And so uh, that's the only comment that I would make. I would love to take a second for mom Thank you. I would argue that the best interest of the children is also to have married parents. And I know that that has factored largely into the arguments across the country is that there are children being raised by same-sex parents who are extremely qualified, they're committed, they're building a life together, and those children are being discriminated against by being raised by unmarried parents. That puts their child in peril because they are not able to adequately provide and care for their child in case of emergency. So the legal protections and rights that marriage provides are incredibly unique to the institution of marriage, and by denying access to those rights and protections, for a child, that's discriminatory and that's dangerous for those children. John, I want to. Uh, do we have a question? Yeah. We got questions. <laughs> Excellent. This is what it's all about. Uh, it, it appears that we're not going to get rid of the gay lesbian community because of the various laws that we're talking about. It's going to continue on. The habitation is going to continue. It appears that part of this is because of the word marriage which in my opinion is a, is a religious term. And uh, would it not at least reduce the, the angst if we said, okay, the legal rights that these people want, give it to them. You know, social security rights, pension rights. I mean, I'm a financial planner, so I understand that people who are legally bound together have legal rights that, that marriage gives. Just get rid of the word marriage. John? I mean, there are, there are some people that are arguing similar but not exactly the same that we should just make this a form of contracts in which all relationships are contractual agreements. The problem with that is that you immediately legitimize every aberrant form of marriage that I showed you on the screen and others you couldn't even imagine. Uh, protection of children and women who are walked out on by their husbands. If you, if you remove the statutory provisions for marriage and domestic relations, then you got a huge free-for-all you talk about contracts. If you don't have a contract, it's a draconian result, especially for children and, 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 and wives who are abandoned with a single uh, income. But then you also got a situation where the courts are now making these decisions, more government interference, not less. It's more government interference if you go to private contracts. Um, I do think that uh, marriage is an institution, the state has a compelling interest in it. And we spend $1.9 billion every year just in Florida. That's the cost of family fragmentation as a result of unwed childbearing and divorce. So there's, there's an economic impact here when, this, when a family fragments, is destroyed, the state comes in, there's DC out, there's social services, and it's taxpayers' dollars that are going to, to fund that. And, and the state, uh, and if we can, we're not, and the legislature doesn't like to talk about marriage and family. They ought to be talking about it, because if we can strengthen marriage and the family, you're simultaneously solving so many other domestic problems at the same time. And I think you're eager to respond. I am. I think it's interesting that we both uh, don't like that idea particularly. Um, I, I think that that's it's fascinating because um, words matter and social institutions matter, as you mentioned, and the meaning of marriage is um, incredibly significant to couples who decide to marry. And I think that once you codify a social institution into law, you are um, accountable to the Constitution, you're accountable to your your um, governmental responsibilities, and so I think that the second marriage became a legal institution, it became something that you cannot deny to people based on their um, sex, gender, race, all of those things, and so I think that that's the problem, is that words mean things, and social institutions mean things, and that you can't deny that to someone for something like their sexual orientation. David wants to get a word in here quick. Regarding your question, we, and I've already heard, words do matter. When I was speaking about the values that are associated with marriage, when we really try to uh, identify, well, what is it that brings about these values that are associated to marriage, it really is the idea of commitment. Uh, I know folks throw that word out there, commitment, uh, I mean, I've heard folks say, well, we're so committed to each other, we just bought a sofa from rooms to go, and the payments start in 2025. Uh, but married folks really engage in committing behavior. We don't see it with cohabitating folks. I mean, if you survey married folks, 
How many of y'all are you know signed on a 30-year mortgage with your with your husband and your wife? Hands go up. Not so much with cohabitors. How many of you are share a joint retirement account together? You don't find as many cohabitors who share a joint retirement account. So words do matter, but it's really where the rubber meets the road concerning the commitment in the institution. We have more questions in the audience. Uh, David mentioned that marriage can take a great uh, deal of dynamic change. I think he used the word elastic, <coughs> elasticity. Um, what is the uh, limit of the elasticity of marriage? First of all, is there one? What is it? And third point of that question is, who makes that determination? Well, any determination regarding where marriage ends up, how it develops and moves forward, we all make that decision. That is a community-based, nation-based decision. Uh, we are only here tonight looking at one fine point concerning the institution. Uh, there are other points, if you ask me what I think I have you no know, concerns about regarding marriage. I have concerns regarding about the low rates of marriage. Co cohabitation seems to be outpacing uh, the institution of marriage. Uh, I am concerned when we look at data that you know, everybody thinks that cohabitating is you know, great practice, a test run to ensure that your marriage is safe. Uh, the data would actually suggest not quite double, but you know, first-time divorce rates are at about 40%. All-time divorce rates uh, are at 50%, uh, because second-time marriages fail more than first, and thirds fail more than seconds. But first-time divorce rates are around 40%. But if you live with your partner before you get married to your partner, your divorce rate is probably somewhere between about 60 and 70%. Uh, cohabitation is a nominal practice in preparation for divorce. Those are actually where some of my concerns go concerning the longevity of the institution. Uh, my cons as a sociologist, I don't see this particular question uh, before us as one that would actually end the institution of marriage. I think there are other concerns out there that are uh, actually of concern regarding the institution of marriage. It'd be fascinating to see if that statistic about cohabitation, if uh, same-sex marriage was allowed to proceed, whether all the uh, gay people who have cohabitated for all this time face those same rates. That has actually been one of the arguments, both for and against. Some have looked at, well, these are not stable relationships. You know, couples get together and then they break up, they get together with somebody else, they break up. That's kind of the pattern of cohabitation. So the question is, if you are now married and you're engaging in committing behavior, are you going to see divorce rates that tend to parallel and are consistent with heterosexual marriages? Uh, again, we don't have the data. These are incredibly interesting times to live in if you're a social scientist. Mm -hmm. We have other questions. I think we have one over here. I appreciate you bringing up the matter of cohabitation because it sort of uh, indirectly addresses the state of marriage itself and whether marriage is producing happier, more fulfilled people. I've seen some interesting statistics on the length of cohabitation comparing the U.S. and France. And as I remember those statistics, the average length of time that a U.S. couple cohabits is like 1.3 years. The average length of time that a French couple cohabits is 9.7 years. Uh, can you confirm or, or deny those statistics? Um, I can't confirm concerning raw numbers. I'll confirm in a general sense that the European model towards habitation um, does promote longer lengths of stay and more likely in European relationships that cohabitation is viewed as this is how it's just going to be. There is no expectation of marriage. Um, but I, I, I can't speak to 9.5 or 10.5 without doing a little bit of research. Dave, I can't access Sari right now. Question in here. Yeah. I think the answer is the French drink more wine. Exactly. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Jason. Um, Hannah, first of all, I would like to thank you for fighting the good fight. And and being a part of this huge, quick movement. And 
I'm really excited because I had sort of resigned myself to not ever being able to get married, and I just kind of agreed with it. And this is why this is so exciting for me, because the prospect of being able to have, excuse me, the same thing that my parents is just a really emotional thing for me. Excuse me. Thank you. <laughs> there, there, are, there are a ton of emotions involved in this. I mean, and they are real. I want to go toward one other thing, because we had a second question. And it was about banning discrimination in housing, et cetera. And um, Ben brought up the case of the justice in one of these uh, cases, who, who brought up um, uh, biracial marriages, and it said, you know, it was a definition, you know, actually of discrimination based on race. Is it, John, this case? Make the argument that this is not discriminatory. The idea that we should not allow same-sex marriage. Um, you know, the, the reality of it is this: discrimination has become this kind of knee-jerk word that we throw out in political context, and everybody's, "Oh, it's horrible." Well, the reality of it is this: responsible citizens, we're supposed to discriminate. We're supposed to discriminate between right and wrong, good and bad, healthy behavior and unhealthy behavior. That's what we do. But what we've done is, it's like. Everything's up for grabs. Don't judge me, bro, is, is the kind of the big mantra of today. And yet we're seeing this rapid social change that's like it's only the last nanosecond of human history. We're acting as if it's not going to affect it. And it's going to, I would submit, it's going to have a radical, radical effect upon our society. Look at on no fault divorce. One of my favorite presidents is Ronald Reagan. Uh, but one of the things he did that was extremely boneheaded was in January 1st, 1973, I believe it was, he signed the very first no fault divorce law in existence. And just like we see same-sex marriage, all the experts were saying, this is the way to go. You know, feminists were saying, cut the lawyers out. And so it swept across the entire country. Every state in the union adopted no fault divorce. What's the damage report? It's been a sociological disaster. I mean, more impoverished single moms, more irresponsible dads, more destroyed homes, because people can unilaterally leave, even when there's kids, with no justification whatsoever. But it is the thinking behind your opposition to same-sex marriage based on the need of society to discriminate against gay people. Look, pu public policy, the reason we have law is that law encourages behavior that's healthy, discourages behavior that's unhealthy. Some behaviors are so bad we ban them, others we tax them like cigarettes, right? So I view this as like, uh, why do we give benefits to marriage? It's like owning a home, right? Homeowners get all kinds of economic benefits that people that rent a home don't get. Is that because we think the person that rents a home is lesser in dignity or value before God or the Constitution? No, it's because people that own homes, it stimulates the economy, they shop at Lowe's, it creates safer communities, there's less crime, and so we want to encourage that behavior. Same thing with marriage. We give benefits to marriage that we don't give to my sister who's single, not gay, but living with another person all of her life. That doesn't benefit society in the same way, so that's why we don't give benefits to that uh, same-sex couple. And so it's not a matter of discrimination, it's a matter of what's in the best interest of children, families, and the common good of society. And I would submit wow. that keeping marriage the way it's always been is the best way to do that. Questions? Yeah, a couple of them. The reason that people get tax breaks for buying homes is because that's the way the tax laws are written to stimulate our economy. It isn't because one group is heterosexual and one group is homosexual. Um, as for children in marriage, um, there's a whole lot of kids that are being harmed by heterosexual marriages. And so it's not something that we can say is going to happen in a homosexual marriage. Thank you. And I specifically did not make that argument because I don't think that's true. I think that gay people can love and care. It's just not the best arrangement. The best arrangement for data shows and common sense shows the mom and dad. David, there's someone behind you that like to ask a question. Oh, wow, look at that, another microphone. <laughs> Thank you. The gentleman, the gentleman said, um, let's keep marriage as it's always been. And I have to say that the concept of marriage in the United States has changed very much over time. When the Constitution was written, women were not allowed to own property. Women could not vote. 
it took a constitutional amendment to change those parts of marriage to become equal partners in marriage. So to keep marriage as it's always been is kind of like, it's a pie in the sky kind of idea. Just like idealizing um, being married, you can say marriage is a man and a woman and that's the most successful for children, but if 50% of our families have been broken up, I would say that children need the protection of whomever will love them best. And if that means a two-sex parent a situation, getting kids out of foster care and taking care of the children that result from those divorce situations, the question should be what is in the best interest of the families that exist in reality? Yeah, I mean, we've seen, what we're seeing now in our lifetime is, is radical social change that's unprecedented in the history of human affairs. Things that were unthinkable just a gener couple generations ago are now only thinkable but they're being promoted as virtues. And so we're seeing this radical change. Some of this social change has been good, no question. But the change we're seeing today, I would submit to you, is, is, is aiming right at the essence of marriage and family structures that provide basic social order. Government doesn't start in Tallahassee, D.C. It starts around the family table. And so same-sex marriage is one of many, I would submit, uh, things that are further breaking down this structure and is not in the best interest of children or families. And, and, Oh, sorry. Can, I, can I interject on that? Uh, because this issue came up in a very interesting way. I think the questioner and John's exchange, it came up in a very interesting way in, in the litigation over Indiana's ban. And um, Judge Posner, who is a, a relatively conservative judge, federal judge in Chicago, addressed this in, in his opinion um, for that court that struck down Indiana's ban. And, and Indiana was arguing that the point of marriage is to encourage loving, child-rearing environments where parents can care for their biological children together. And Judge Posner asked, in his opinion, you know, why the word biological? I mean, why not adopt it? And the plaintiffs in that case made the argument that in the state of Indiana, homosexual couples are five times as likely to be raising an adopted child as heterosexual couples. And, um, and that there is some social benefit there from the perspective of providing a, a home, a loving home, for raising those children. So anyway, I just thought that was an interesting point that, that is coming up in these cases. And Judge, you've been kind of over there in the corner. Um, <laughs> you know you want to talk. I know. Be my I, guest. I actually would love to jump back and just respond to what you said. I'd like to thank you for sharing. And I, I um, am with you on the emotional nature of the possibility of marriage for people like us. Um, who you know haven't gotten married yet. So I want to just thank you for sharing that. I also would love to circle back to the idea of non-discrimination protections because I think that um, we're in a really unique situation here in Florida where we have the freedom to marry, same sex couples are getting married. And in Florida, you can get married on Saturday, you can go to work on Monday, you can put a picture of your new spouse on your desk, and you can get fired for being a lesbian, gay, or bisexual, or transgender here in Florida. That feels fundamentally wrong to me, um, and it does not feel like our duty is to discriminate against people in workplaces, in places of public accommodation, and in housing. So I would argue that it is not good for society to, to discriminate in that way, and what we found is that business agrees with us. Over 80% of Fortune 500 companies in the nation have non-discrimination policies that say that they do not make hiring and firing decisions based on sexual orientation, as well as gender identity or expression, and that these non-discrimination protections actually make businesses more competitive, more successful. Um, and so I, I just fundamentally disagree that discrimination is, is good for business or good for society. John, where does your organization stand on um, laws uh, that, that has just described? I think adding uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression to human rights ordinances and sexual uh, non-discrimination ordinances is the most oppressive and most dangerous thing that we're doing right now as a society. Um, it, it is, I, I gave you example after example of where these are being used as weapons. I mean, all of a sudden, sexual liberty, whatever that is, is now trumping core First Amendment 
freedom of speech and freedom of religion that men and women bled and died for. It's being trumped all of a sudden by judges as if it doesn't even exist. And so this is this is wrong. Look, if my I just hired a new receptionist. She's a young lady. If she decides unilaterally chooses to have a sexual reassignment surgery, I should be able to reposition her to another place in my law firm or fire her without her suing me for money damages and, and all of that. I mean, that's freedom of association, that's the free marketplace, that's America. And these laws are, are being used to punish people when people just unilaterally decide to change their appearance. I'm interested in that argument, because uh, I've heard that one before. This was, I've, I've always struggled with, with this. Then do I have the right to fire someone if it's a cross on their desk and disagree with mine? If there's an immutable class, race, or a constitutional right, those are protected classes, immutability or constitutional protection. Um, these new categories are just coming out of nowhere. Uh, they have no history or tradition in the Constitution or otherwise. And we're just elevating them up, above and over immutable classes and constitutional rights. Right. We have questions? Yeah, right. Uh, we're going to go this way. Yeah. I just want to address uh, the issue of uh, discrimination. I think that uh, discrimination is refers to something that you were you were born with, and I think to uh, to to place same-sex marriage as tantamount to to that assumption that it's something that you were born with is is not right because discrimination refers to aspects of your person as far as your race, your gender, uh, even your sex. Those are aspects that you were born with. But homosexuality is something that you're not born with. So oh, we're all oh, all oh. All right, two questions. You're going to have to hold this. We have to, I just happen to have two. I have to have a psychologist and a lawyer here. So I'm going to go lawyer first. What is discrimination? Well, you know, it's a great question. And, and how much time do we have? <laughs> um, I will say this. I mean, the, the arguments that, I mean, the best arguments, I think, for the, the, that on behalf of these states that, that are trying to defend these bans, the, the, the cases that are on appeal are on appeal from a federal appeals court in Cincinnati. And the judge that wrote that opinion did it brilliantly. And he, he ruled that there's nothing, that it's not his position, it's not his place, to strike down these laws that ban same-sex marriage. And, and basically what he said is he conceded that it's discriminatory. He said, you know, we understand, we the court understand that we're depriving some benefits, you know, some of which are profound, the, the right to visit someone in the hospital who's sick, um, and some of which are pretty mundane, the right to file a joint tax return. We concede that we're discriminating and we're denying you those um, opportunities. Um, but do the benefits of traditional marriage outweigh that? And, and the way he answered that question, which I thought was brilliant, was to say, it's not my decision as a judge to answer that question. It's, it's your decision as the people to elect your representatives to go to Tallahassee and pass these laws. And, um, I think that will be the argument on behalf of the states that will be the most possibly appealing to the justices, sort of this state rights argument, and it concedes that there's some discriminatory impact on these laws, but it basically says it shouldn't be up to you judges to, to interfere with that because the people have a way of expressing their opinions on that. Um, but almost all the federal judges that have heard that argument so far have not bought it. <laughs> They've said, I don't buy it. You know, you're, you're treating this, this small minority very differently in a way that discriminates. And so that's sort of just a little overview of, of how that word is being thrown around in the case. All right, before we go back to the floor, David, nature or nurture? Nature or nurture. I just want to take a peek at who answered the question. I always like to know who I'm looking at when I'm answering a question. Not that I have a good answer for you. Listen, it, it, and obviously we have attorneys, 
we are talking about a political issue. Whenever we raise the question, is homosexuality nature versus nurture, as though you can dichotomize the question, I understand that there are interests that are involved in saying it is nature, or there are interests that say it is nurture. Um, I will say that in the field of psychiatry, 1952, we came up with the very first Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Mental Disorders, our Bible on Mental Illness. Homosexuality was included as a disease, as a psychiatric disease. It was omitted um, decades later, no longer in there, as a psychological disorder. One of the arguments as to why it was removed, there was never an instance where you were able to successfully treat it, cure it. That certainly provides some degree of basis to say it is not a social phenomenon. To provide argument on the opposite side of the coin, I'll refer to a student whose name I long, long forget, my first year teaching, no tenure, scared out of my mind, and the student came up with, to me with a brilliant idea for, her soci for the sociology paper. He would like to take every uh, issue of Playboy magazine and statistically graph the measurements of the centerfold to show how those measurements have changed over the decades. I said, no, I don't have tenure. No, you're not doing that, you're not doing that project. Uh, yet, there's an argument there. Those measurements have changed. By today's standards, Marilyn Monroe would not make it into that magazine. So our ideas as to what might be considered to be attractive have changed and adopted. So the answer concerning nature versus nurture, I'd be a fool if I said it's this or it's that. Uh, I know there's research that tends to argue in favor for, tends to argue in opposition to. Uh, I'm not just trying to be middle of the road. Uh, if you ask my opinion as a question, uh, I would say there's probably a degree of influence concerning environment, uh, but it is not environmentally, behaviorally determined. Any more questions from all? Yeah, we have one still over here, Dave. Uh, we're getting there. And then bounce over here, too. So back to about firing your employee. So no matter how hard of a worker they are, you would still fire them. If I'm an employer, that's what we have. It's called right, right to Correct, but I'm just wondering if they're a hard worker, you would still fire them based on that? I would try to relocate them, actually, to a place that would be more appropriate if I thought they were not. Presented. Even if they brought you, I mean, your business is different, but even though they, if they brought you more business or something like that, you would still do that? The point is it should be my call as the boss, not the state's call, not the government's call, and, and giving the right to somebody to sue me because I reassign an employee to another place. That's the point. All right, we have a bunch of questions over here. Um, if we, yeah, and then across the table, so can you more way patient one? Go ahead. Hi, twice Hi. now I've heard you mention that you'd like to relocate somewhere, you should have the right to relocate someone based on their appearance. Um, you mentioned a transgender person, now you're just saying their appearance, you should be allowed to relocate them. So if I were to shave my head or gain 200 pounds, you're saying that it's appropriate to fire me based on that? Because it's just an appearance. That, that's your argument, not mine. Um, I'm just curious. The point is, is that we're talking about freedom here. We're talking about liberty. We're talking about the marketplace. Okay? There's a reason why Chick-fil-A does things a certain way than, let's say, other chicken businesses. Okay? And so they have a brand, and they should be able to enforce their brand. Uh, and I think that's what the free market is about. Right. Um, yeah, go ahead. While we pass the mic, I would ahead. just um, say that the Florida Civil Rights Act was um, passed into law in the 60s, and it includes protected classes of people. So it prohibits discrimination in work, in um, employment, housing, and public accommodations on the basis of race, religion, national origin, marital status, biological sex. These are protected classes of people. These are people who we as a as society have decided you cannot make hiring and firing decisions based on these characteristics. You cannot deny these people the service, and you can't evict them from housing based on these determinations. And our proposal and what we see the, the society moving in favor of is including sexual orientation and gender identity or expression in existing law, modernizing state law, not passing new legislation, but 72% of Americans agree that you shouldn't be fired based on who you love or who you are. Uh, I, I just totally disagree with that because just a few years ago, I couldn't get hired because of the way I look, you know, but at the
the same time. I understand what you're saying, but I really think this argument, you know, it's shifted so many different places, and what's getting lost is, I think the argument starts because someone wanted some benefits, something due to them. Something has to do more with economics than it has to do with anything else, because I see gay people where I work at. I see, I see gay people everywhere I go. So there, it's not like you can't go in the store. You have to go in the back of the restaurant. You know what I mean? So really it's about if your partner dies or if you want to buy a house, should they discriminate against you like that? Well, I don't think the bank discriminates against you because if you got the money, the bankers got something to help you out with. So you know what I mean? But, but, but what I'm saying is when, when, it comes, when it comes to the question of same-sex marriage, why should it have to be on the law books? You know, I mean, you want to take existing laws and everything's moving, moving like this, like this, like this, like this. It took this great country that we live in hundreds of years to get the race problem right. So you want me to believe that we can really end this debate by just allowing this like right in the last 10 years? Oh yeah, everything's gonna, be, will that end the debate? If you can get married and get your benefits, will that stop the conversation? It will absolutely still be individuals who choose to discriminate based on sincerely held moral or religious convictions um, on the basis of sexual orientation, on the basis of race, on the basis of uh, marital status. But as a society, we've decided that those classes of people should not be discriminated against in, in government controlled issues like how can you be hired, how can you be fired, what housing do you have access to. Those, those are issues with which the government absolutely has a vested interest to protect its citizens against discrimination. I think you're absolutely right, people will still experience discrimination, but having the legal recourse to say, my government says that I shouldn't face this discrimination, that matters. We are um, right, getting ready to wrap up here. I want to say one thing. We're going to have one more question, then we do have to start to shut things up. Best audience ever. <laughs> what a great question. Last question. You don't have anything to live up to. <laughs> uh, since 1787, uh, there have been a number of changes in the way we view the Constitution. You know. African-American slaves were defined as three-fifths of a person. Uh, women were not allowed to own property or vote or resist the sexual advances of their husbands. They could be raped and that wouldn't break the law. Um, this, the suffragette movement was a very important movement. The civil rights uh, legislation of the mid-60s, uh, segregation of schools was eliminated between the races and uh, now we have the uh, discrimination against uh, LGBT people. Isn't the issue that perhaps those judges, uh, that judge was, uh, the judges who have overturned the bans thinking about is that our Constitution guarantees equality? Legal. Uh, well, you know, you've, you've hit on the key debate in constitutional law. There are a group of judges that that have what is called an originalist interpretation of the Constitution, and they want to look back to what did the founding fathers mean when they wrote this, um, and then there's a group of judges that take a view sort of like what you're espousing, which is uh, that the Constitution is a living document, and that these, these terms in them, these big sweeping terms like liberty and equality, the meaning of those words evolved as our society evolves. Um, as I'll, I'll just close my little part out by making a prediction because I think it's fun to get yourself on the record and there are like eight cameras back there. Uh, so, you know, I will, Zoom in, I will make my, no one knows, of course, what the Supreme Court will do. Certainly, no, you know, any, there are lots of lawyers around the world that are following this thing. Um, um, I, I, most legal commentators and scholars who are following this expect the Supreme Court to rule one way or the other five to four. And most of them think that the swing justice is Justice Kennedy, who wrote the opinion in United States versus Windsor. And most lawyers are not sure which way he will go. Because as John and I were talking beforehand, Justice Kennedy, while he's a big believer in some of these concepts like liberty and equality, he wrote the opinion in Windsor. He also has a lot of respect for states' rights and federalism arguments really um, appeal to them. Um, my prediction is that the Supreme Court's ultimate decision is, going, is not going to be five to four, but that the majority opinion will also include the Chief Justice, who I think is um, a political 
uh, politically savvy Chief Justice, and on major cases of great social importance, he wants to build a broad coalition, as broad of a coalition as he can in the case. I mean, we saw that in the way he joined in with majority opinion on the health care case, even though he's a conservative judge. So, um, it, you know, for what it's worth, uh, to great city of Seminole, <laughs> I, I expect I expect an opinion that would will not be a five four opinion, but I'm in the very small minority of people that think that. This is a lot of fun. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank thanks, Charlie. We are cut out out of time, and we like to keep these things on time. Um, ben, thank you very much for all your insights. I learned a whole heck of a lot, David. Wow, I hadn't thought about any of that. <laughs> um, Hannah, thank you so much. Your insights were much appreciated, and John. Very good. That's, thanks to you. A couple of these people came all the way from Orlando to be here tonight. Um, and that's a long drive, and we appreciate that. And I, again, every question tonight raised another question and raised another thought in my head. I hope that's how it went for you. That's why these Village Square meetings are so important. Um, I have probably more questions than I came, came in with, but I have also a lot more information, and I hope you do too. Thank you.